Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to have you all here tonight for the first talk in uh, my fall speaker series. Uh, I'm Adam Ellenboss. For those of you who um, know me uh, or um, have been around the speaker series before, uh, you know the drill. You, I kind of take some time to introduce what we're doing tonight in the speaker series and how you can learn more about the speaker series and stuff like that. Then we'll introduce our speaker, Becca, tonight and her topic, which is the Astrology of Jung's Red Book. And then we'll be diving in. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, this speaker series program is something I started almost 10 years ago now. I mean, it was 2010 when I started it. And uh, I just started having three, sometimes four speakers come out once a season. So once between Capricorn and Pisces, I've got three, four speakers coming out and giving talks. And then between Aries and and Gemini, three more speakers coming out. So I've been doing that. It's been quite a rhythm to keep, but it's been, I think one of the favorite, actually like, you know, one of my, maybe the, my favorite features of my career to this point, because I get to learn from so many incredible people and those students who are studying with me in my programs get to sit and hear really amazing astrologers um, talking about all different kinds of topics in the, in the world of astrology. So um, I'm going to tell you about our fall speaker series and what's on the menu for uh, the next three weeks. Uh, we'll do that first. And I'm going to switch over to uh, show you the events page if you haven't seen it at my website, which is nightlightastrology.com. So you can find the events page at nightlightastrology.com. Oops. Got someone who is unmuted. I'm going to mute everything. Okay, there we go. So uh, you can find the events page, nightlightastrology.com, and then there's upcoming events tab. Just click on that and you will see whatever the speakers are for the upcoming or current season. So for this season, tonight, where we have Becca Tarnas with us giving a talk on the Astrology of Jung's Red Book. Um, next Wednesday, on November 13th at 7 p.m., Alex Garrett will be here giving a talk on the lunation cycle. She is a fantastic astrologer, longtime personal apprentice with um, Demetra George. And um, then, and she's giving a talk on the lunation cycle. So how to, how to look at the different phases of the moon within the birth chart and sometimes the progress chart as well. That should be a really fun talk. And then uh, Laura Machetti is going to be here on um, Sunday, November 17th. That's at noon Eastern time. And, her talk is called The Ecological Phenomenology of the Cosmic Now, which sounds sort of like an acid trip. Um, but, but actually, this is going to be um, a really incredible talk about the ancient uh, divinatory origins of astrology um, and the, also the connection with astrology in the natural world. Uh, Laura is uh, fantastic. And I know actually Becca and Laura are uh, buddies. So um, I'm sure uh, Becca could uh, pump up her talk as well. But that's going to be awesome. I've been hoping to have Laura give a talk for a while. We finally figured it, uh, out a date that could work. And so that's going to be another great talk. Um, so you can check out all of these again at nightlightastrology.com on the events page. Every one of our talks is completely open to the public, meaning you can come for free. The logins are listed at the bottom of each uh, speaker's um, page and bio. You can find it at the bottom. Just click the Zoom login link at the time of the meeting as it's listed and join us for free. Uh, during the talk, we ask for donations, but if you can't afford to pitch in anything, you're welcome to be here. The suggested donation for every one of our events is $15 to $25. You will hear me ring the donation bell, so to speak, in the chat box a bunch of times tonight. I'll just put it in there and say, hey, remember to donate if you haven't yet. 15 to 25 is our suggested rate. Um, but if you can do more, it helps for those who don't have as much. Um, and if you can only do a very little, uh, you know, g give what you can. The exchange is what really matters, right? We're getting something amazing from our speakers and from, uh, and from our astrologers. This is their living. This is how um, most of the astrologers that come through my program are at least part-time, full-time practicing astrologers, which means that um, this is part of how they make their living. So pitching in helps them to be rewarded for years and years and years of really hard work. Um, the other thing is that this program uh, is part of an intention that I've had since I started doing astrology uh, back in 2010, which is to make astrological education accessible to more people. Because 
what I noticed when I first started studying astrology, because I was, I was living, um, you know, pr pretty much, um, uh, pretty close to the poverty line in New York city. You know, it was, it, for me, it was kind of fun at the time. Now that I have a family, I look back and I'm like, you know, wow, what a lot of crazy risks I took and stuff like that. But I was living, I had, I had, I was just living in a crappy apartment and I had, you know, next to no money and I could barely ever afford to go to really cool astrological things that were happening, what to speak of large conferences where you have to spend a lot of money on a plane ticket and a conference cost and stuff like that. But I knew that the best people that I could learn from, you know, I wasn't going to find a lot of that. Um, you know, I wasn't going to find the best stuff, the best classes and stuff like that. Um, online at that time anyway. So part of the intention of this series has been to make astrological education accessible for more people. So that's why we say just come, just be here. If you can't donate anything tonight, pay it forward, share your knowledge, wisdom, and love of astrology with others. And then um, if you can afford to donate, please do. Please give generously if you can. So that's, that's how we do things. That's how we roll. And it's been really fun also to bring in people into this program who have a very different approach to astrology or different voice or different interests or specialties than myself. I do that intentionally to make sure that the students who are studying with me year round um, get a, a range of voices. They have a bit more of an ecumenical experience because, you know, anytime, anytime you kind of entrain yourself to one uh, teacher, sometimes um, it's good to have those extra voices coming in. So at any rate, uh, that's, that's just an introduction to what this program is. If you're new here for the first time, I hope you'll come back and check out other programs. You can always check in at nightlightastrology.com on the events page to see what's coming in the cycle in the season to come. Um, you can also, like, if you scroll down, you'll see that I have a special series of uh, seminar series on ancient astrology and the nodes of the moon happening in January. Sometimes there's other events too you can check up on. Um, so that being said, I want to introduce our speaker for this evening. Oh, actually, before I do that, almost forgot. This is how you donate for tonight. Uh, if you're at nightlightastrology.com, I'm going to put this into the chat box right now so that you can see it. But if you go to nightlightastrology.com and check out the, uh, under the upcoming events tab, there's also a payments and donations button. If you click on that, you'll come to this page that you can see on the screen right now. And there's a make a donation button. So um, if you click on that button, you'll have the opportunity to enter in the amount that you wish, 15 to $25 is suggested for tonight. And then you can use a credit debit card or a PayPal account, any, any of those are fine. So there's the link in the chat box right now. Becca is a fantastic astrologer. Um, she has a PhD. She is a uh, learned, amazing person. And we're lucky to have her here tonight. So let's support her. Uh, let's kick in and and uh, donate as much as we can to support our speaker. So now I'm going to introduce Becca, and I'm super excited to hear about her talk this evening, which is the official uh, title for tonight's talk is The Astrology of Jung's Red Book. Um, so um, I'll let Becca tell you more about this topic. There have been a number of books that have come out recently, um, especially by uh, Liz Green, um, that have been exploring the relationship that Carl Jung, uh, the great uh, pioneer in some ways of uh, archetypal psychology, depth psychology, uh, the relationship that he had to astrology, which frankly, um, not a lot of people know a lot about. Uh, so uh, this should be a really great talk looking at the astrological symbolism um, that was uh, to be found in Jung's life and his, and his um, maybe one of the most esoteric uh, books that he uh, wrote, the Red Book, probably the most. I'm, I'm sure Becca would say that. Becca is a uh, PhD, counseling astrologer, scholar, artist, editor of Archi, the Journal of Archetypal Cosmology. She received her doctorate in philosophy and religion from California Institute of Integral Studies with her dissertation titled The Back of Beyond, the Red Books of Carl Jung and Tolkien. Her research interests include depth psychology, literature, philosophy, and the ecological imagination. She teaches in the Jungian Psychology and Archetypal Studies program at Pacifica Graduate Institute and online for both neural learning and psychosomatica. Her website is beccatarnas.com. I'm going to put that into the chat box right now as well. And um, Becca, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can take it over. Thank you for being here. We're really excited to hear uh, what you have to share with us tonight. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Um, it's, I just, I so enjoy everything that you bring together for these series. And 
um, it really is such an honor to be able to uh, talk about these things in this wide reaching context. So thank you so much for providing that. It's, it's really extraordinary. Of course, I also want, want to invite everyone. We have many web, web camera places available. Um, your web cameras are turned off right now, but you are welcome to turn them on if you wish to join us. We'd love to see a few more faces. Um, I don't know if they are manually turned off or not, but nope. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Nick. Nice to see you. Okay, go ahead, Becca. Take us away. All right. Well, let me just share my screen, the PowerPoint, and hopefully everyone can see that. So what I'm going to be speaking about tonight, as Adam shared, uh, is Carl Gustav Jung's Red Book and looking at the astrology that is related to that. And I mean that in multiple ways. So first of all, the Red Book is, it's a record. It's a record of fantasy visions that came to Jung over a period of a number of years, from 1913 to 1930. He worked on the Red Book. And I'll be getting more into the specifics of that as we go on. But I'm going to be using astrology in relation to understanding Jung's Red Book from a number of different angles. First of all, looking at the world transits of what the alignments were that were happening when Jung was going through these experiences, that these really, you could say, visionary experiences that he recorded in the Red Book. And then also we're going to be looking a little bit at Jung's birth chart and as well at his personal transits at certain significant points along the way as he was going through his Red Book period. Then from a different angle, I'm going to at least touch on Jung's own relationship to practicing astrology. And as Adam mentioned, this isn't something that's been focused a lot, uh, on all that much, um, but it has been coming more and more to the fore. And in the depth psychological tradition, which comes from Freud, from Jung, and then has evolved through a number of different branches as developed by different psychologists. One who I'm greatly influenced by is James Hillman, who's an archetypal psychologist. I know he's a great hero of Adams as well. Um, so astrology is one of the hidden roots of depth psychology and something that was really informing Jung's development of what he called analytical psychology. So more about Jung's relationship to astrology has been emerging. And in the world of Jungian psychology and um, archetypal studies and so forth, that conversation is happening more and more. And finally, I'm going to be looking at drawing primarily on the work of Liz Green, how Jung actually used astrology in the creation and the shaping of his Red Book. So you can see there's a lot of different ways to use astrology in relation to understanding the Red Book. Now, I recognize that we have a broad audience here, and some of you may be more familiar with astrology, some less so. Some of you might be more familiar with Jung's work and with depth psychology, some less so. Some of you maybe have even read the Red Book. Some of you maybe own the Red Book but haven't read it. I know a lot of people who own the Red Book. I'm seeing some nods there. Um, people who own the Red Book and maybe have read some of it but not all of it. But one reason that people will own a copy of the Red Book and not read it is because it's filled with extraordinary illustrations. They are so enrapturing and beautiful and magnificent and horrifying. And so there are not enough adjectives to describe these images. So I just want to say that the slides that I will be sharing throughout my talk, every work of art in it was done by Carl Jung. So they're all drawn from his red book. So you'll get a sampling at least of what is present in the book. And 
it is quite a, a leap to go from looking through the images in the Red Book to digesting the text. And it's one of those books that you can read innumerable times and get more and more out of and deepen into. As Adam mentioned, I wrote my PhD dissertation on Jung's Red Book and actually parallels between Jung's Red Book and the Red Book of Westmarch of J.R.R. Tolkien. I won't be getting into any of those parallels here, but it led me down this path of studying the Red Book deeply. And the thing that I find, the more I deepen my relationship to this work of, uh, of literature, of psychology, of spirituality, of art, that I realize how little I really know. In, in learning more, I find that there's still such a vast expanse to discover. So tonight's talk will really just be giving a taste of what is present in this extraordinary book. And for those of you who have never seen a copy of the Red Book, it's massive. It's probably almost two feet tall. Um, no, maybe I'm looking over at my copy. Well, it's about a foot and a half tall, quite heavy, several inches thick. It's, it's a, a massive tome. So I'm talking about this book, the, um, the Red Book, but what, what is it? The question of what is the Red Book, it can be answered from a variety of perspectives. So in his late 30s, the depth psychologist and psychiatrist Carl Gustav Jung began to have profound visionary experiences. He was having these powerful fantasies. They were expressions of what he came to call active imagination. And I'll get into what active imagination is shortly. And Jung inscribed these visions in this large book that he wrote out in calligraphic lettering and he accompanied the writing with these rich illustrations and the book was bound with two covers of red leather and you can see here that it's an enormous book to contain all of these visions and he called the book liber novus and that means the new book but it's better known simply as the red book named after the color of its cover. So it is a record of an experience of vision, imagination, of the interior of the psyche. This is how this great psychiatrist really came to understand what the human psyche is, as well as, of course, working with all of his patients as he did over the course of his career. But this was the internal study, the self experiment. And he called it his confrontation with the unconscious, these journeys into the psychic underworld or a confrontation with the unconscious. And he also called it his most difficult experiment. And even that word experiment, it indicates the scientific element that really was a component of the project for Jung at least from his perspective. Now, most of us wouldn't look at the Red Book and think, ah, oh, yes, this is science. But for Jung, he was trying to have a, an empirical understanding of the contents of the psyche and, even more so, what was in that dark realm of the collective unconscious. So it was, in some ways, a scientific project for him, even if that's not how we would label it today. The book is a manuscript. It was created in the style of the illuminated medieval manuscript. So it might call to mind different illuminated editions of the Bible, for example, or sacred medieval texts. It has that aesthetic quality. Now, not only is the Red Book a record of this interior experience and descent, it is, I would say, a work of art. The book as a whole is a work of art, and it's also filled with these illustrations and full-page paintings, so each one in themselves is a work of art. But 
it's interesting to note that Jung actually denied that what he was doing was art. He kept insisting that this isn't art. This was a record of an experience. Now, I personally would say that the Red Book, in addition to all these other things, it is a story. And I use that term story in the fullest sense of that term. It's an artistic record of fantasy visions. And as such, it does blur the line between inner and outer, and really between what we call reality and what we call imagination. But because it blurs those lines, it starts to bring a sense of reality to what we even mean by the imagination. The imagination is something more than just what's made up. So I would say that the Red Book is a story, it's a work of literature, but we have to be careful exactly what we mean by literature. I don't mean it's something like fiction or a story that's simply been made up by the author. Again, it is a record of an experience. So these visions began and they started off as visions and then they shifted into becoming what Jung called active imagination. And that's a more conscious engagement of actually calling forward, evoking fantasies and images that you can engage with actively or consciously. And the primary period where he was night after night sitting at his desk and going into these profound fantasy visions, that lasted from about late 1913 through 1917. That was really the primary period. And he described this time period as one of the most profound in his life. Now, I just want to share with you a few of these extraordinary images that are in the Red Book. And they're just, the colors are so rich, they're so evocative. And one could spend an enormous amount of time studying each one. Here's a few more as we go through. So Jung described this period as, he said, the years when I was pursuing my inner images were the most important in my life. In them, everything essential was decided. It all began then. The later details are only supplements and clarifications of the material that burst forth from the unconscious and at first swamped me. It was the prima materia for a lifetime's work. And that term prima materia is an alchemical term. It's the prime matter that we get, begin the alchemical opus with. We begin our journey with. So when can we really say that Jung's Red Book period started? I would say, you know, in some ways he was building toward it his entire life. And we can see this in the dreams that came to him, even in earliest childhood. He describes this in his great autobiographical work, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. He had extraordinary dreams from a very young age. He also had this sense of having two personalities. One of them was connected to God's world. So he had this feeling that he lived in two centuries, that he had a, his number one personality and his number two personality. And the number one personality was his normal personality, lived in the current time, you know, when he was a young boy, he was a, a schoolboy who, you know, struggled with algebra, was less than self-assured. But then he had this number two personality that he would feel kind of arise within him. And he felt like this was an old man who maybe was living in the 18th century, but also seemed to have these connections to the Middle Ages. Um, and as I said, he had this feeling that this other personality lived in God's world, in an eternal world. So Jung was already predisposed to kind of have this 
visionary capacity, this awareness of dreams and symbols and images. But I would consider the year 1909 as beginning, you could say, the penumbra of Jung's Red Book period, because this is when Jung entered deeply into a study of mythology, folklore, anthropology, and comparative religion. And he did this for his book, Transformations and Symbols of the Libido, which was published in two volumes in 1911 and 1912. I have the, the German title there, Wandlungen und Symbol der Libido, um, which is how it was originally published. So this was already opening Jung up to, to myth to symbol, to fairy story, and really seeing how myth could be a key to understanding the psyche, to understanding psychology. But I would say that the true beginning of Jung's Red Book period is, should be dated to October of, I'm just realizing I wrote 2013, that's funny, um, of 1913, uh, not 2013. So this is when he was overtaken with a profound vision of a great flood inundating all of Europe and destroying the civilization across the continent. This came to him in 1913. Now, as you probably all know, that's just the year before World War I broke out in 1914, which did bring destruction to the continent. And I'll be going more into, into this particular flood vision later on, but it's the first sequence that's written down in the Red Book. It's right in the opening, in the prologue, in what he calls the way of what is to come. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Jung's methodology, active imagination. His confrontation with the unconscious begins with this spontaneous visionary experience. He's overwhelmed with these images of destruction, and he has no control over his experience of them. His consciousness at that point is passive, and it's essentially receiving these visions of the great flood. Now, the, this visionary experience, though, it didn't come out of nowhere. He'd been actively probing at the unconscious, trying to find a way in so to speak. And he'd been receiving a number of significant dreams in the previous months leading up to this. He'd combed over all the details of his life, focusing particularly on childhood memories. And in this review of his life and his dreams, these were all in service of opening the doorway to the unconscious, opening the doorway to what would turn out to be these visionary experiences. And all this activity, it led him to engage with the method that he would come to call active imagination. And active imagination is essentially, it's something we can all do. It's essentially holding an image or an emotion in your conscious awareness until that image begins to, to move, to shift. And if you stay with it consciously, you actually have the opportunity to step into the drama of the vision itself. So it's a little like meditation, but it's meditation with images and seeing what naturally arises and staying with it. So it's actually a profound act of concentration. So this was Jung's primary method in terms of accessing what he called fantasies, these visions. So the flood vision was totally spontaneous, and a few others were as well. Likewise, he's working with dreams. But most of the fantasies that are recorded in the Red Book were accessed through active imagination. So he really began engaging with active imagination in November of 1913, and it stayed with that intensively through 1914 in particular, 1914, 1915. I'll be exploring some of these most significant fantasies later on with their correlating transits. 
Now, when the First World War broke out in the late summer of 1914, Jung recognized that many of these visions and dreams had actually been prophetic of the war. He had been really worried he was going insane. He thought that some latent psychosis had been unleashed. And of course, he worked with patients who were psychotic all the time. So he knew the symptoms. He knew what to look for. And he was genuinely afraid this is what was happening to him. But when he realized that there was actually a connection between what he was experiencing internally and what was happening in the outer world, he came to recognize that these experiences weren't just in his own private psychological universe. They had something greater to bear on the collective. So that's when he made the decision to create the Red Book, to write these experiences down and to understand where they came from. And that's something that's maybe unique about Jung. That, you know, some people will call him a mystic or a visionary. But when we compare him to other mystics or people who we might call prophets, what makes Jung different is that he never lost the psychiatrist, the empirical doctor who wanted to know not just the meaning of these fantasies, but he wanted to understand the vision-making capacity itself. Where did they come from? So he began to write all of these um, these fantasies down. He first recorded them in his journals, which are called the Black Books. Then he began to write a secondary commentary as he was trying to understand them. Uh, and he reworked and revised that numerous times. And then finally, he started to transcribe it in the calligraphy into the Red Book itself, which he commissioned at that time to be a precious repository for these experiences. So the, the primary period of the fantasies and active imagination was from 1913 to 1917. And he continued to write them out in calligraphy and to do these extraordinary illustrations all the way through the 1920s, ending in 1930. 1928 marked the beginning of the end. That was actually when Jung was given a copy of Richard Wilhelm's translation of the Chinese alchemical text, The Secret of the Golden Flower. And in that alchemical text, Jung found the parallels to the experiences that he'd been having. He'd been searching for parallels to it, really to make sense of what had been going on for him. So with the discovery of alchemy, Jung actually abandoned the 16-year project, the transcription of his fantasies into the Red Book. He set it aside in 1930, incomplete. And for those of you who have a copy, flip to the end and look. It literally trails off mid-sentence. He actually returned to it in 1959 and with the hope of finishing it, but he found that he, he actually couldn't pick up the threads anymore. The doorway to that imaginal source had closed. So he wrote one final page to the Red Book in 1959, and then that was it. It was done. It's an incomplete project. And yet it's a project that informs the unfolding of the development of his whole psychological system. Now, when actually before the war broke out, before the First World War broke out, Jung had asked for a sign that the spirit of the depths, as he called it, was not only the ruler of the inner world or of the inner psyche, but was also the ruler of the outer world. That, when he asked for that sign, that's when he received the prophetic flood vision that foresaw the First World War, that there was this connection between the, the inner and the outer. But, of course, there are other signs that the ruler of the inner world is also the ruler of the outer world. And those of us who work in the field of astrology have some sense of what that is because astrology itself is something that connects the inner with the outer. 
Jung's relationship to astrology began around 1911, as far as we can tell, based on his letters. And he, it, it came up essentially in tandem with his research into mythology and religion for his book, Wandlungen und Symbol der Libido, the, um, uh, that text that I mentioned before. And so it was probably around 1910, 1911, that Jung started learning how to cast charts, learning about astrology. And there's some evidence too that it was Tony Wolf who was his, you could say his spiritual wife. He, he, was, um, he was married to uh, Emma Jung, that was his wife, the mother of his children, but he also had a soror mystica, to use the alchemical term, a spiritual wife, and her name is Tony Wolf. And it seems likely that she may have been the person or one of the people that turned Jung's attention toward astrology. So Jung wrote a letter to Freud in May 8th, 1911, saying, at the moment I am looking into astrology, which seems indispensable for a proper understanding of mythology. There are strange and wondrous things in these lands of darkness. Please don't worry about my wanderings in these infinitudes. I shall return laden with rich booty for our knowledge of the human psyche. So he had this profound sense that astrology would provide a profound key to understanding human psychology. When Freud responded to him, he warned Jung that he'd be accused of mysticism if he continued to study this discipline, if he continued to study astrology. Now, of course, Jung has been accused of mysticism anyway. So, and yet he still made the decision to keep his studies in astrology fairly concealed. So that's part of why it's only been fairly recently that this is being talked about more widely, that Jung was practicing astrology throughout his career. It's interesting, I think, that he was far more open about his work with alchemy, maybe because astrologers were still practicing more openly in uh, the, the age of rationalism, the 19th and 20th, late 19th, early 20th century. But you know, you would be hard pressed to find a practicing alchemist. So he, for some reason, was more open about his work with alchemy. And of course, alchemy is intimately related to astrology. Jung called alchemy the little sister of astrology. So they're very much connected. They're very much related. And the reality is Jung was practicing astrology throughout his life. And he was using it with all of his patients near the end of his career. So this is something that he really did take quite seriously, even if it's not widely known among uh, Jungian circles. So as I've mentioned, the interest in Jung's relationship to astrology, it really has blossomed in recent years. And that interest has been aided by the publication of several really significant texts. Uh, first and foremost, if you look to the, the center of the slide, is the publication of Jung's own writings on astrology. And these were collected and edited by Saffron Rossi and Kieran Legrice. They're both faculty at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And they brought all of these writings together in the volume Jung on Astrology. And they're drawing on anything and everything that Jung wrote about astrology, whether it's in his collected works or in lectures or seminars or in letters uh, or in, in his notes. And they've compiled it all into a single volume. And you can see here that it's, you know, it's not a very wide volume. And yet it's, it's rich and it's beautifully organized. It's really an extraordinary text that Saffron and Kieran have brought together. So that's where you can read Jung's actual words, his actual statements about astrology. The other two texts 
were written by Liz Green. And Liz Green, of course, is a well-respected professional astrologer. She's also a Jungian analyst. So she's really kind of the preeminent authority on this subject. And in early 2018, actually right in tandem with the publication of Jung on Astrology, Green published these two volumes on Jung's relationship to astrology. And the first volume is titled Jung Studies in Astrology, Prophecy, Magic, and the Qualities of Time. And it's so well-researched and just deliciously full of, uh, of references. And uh, Liz Green has just done an extraordinary job with both of these books. So the first one is, uh, it's broader. It's a historical study of Jung's relationship to astrology. And it's drawing on research from his published writings, his correspondence, his private documents, many of the things that are available in Jung on astrology. So they're worth reading side by side. Uh, and Liz Green discusses the astrological sources that Jung drew upon, as well as the way in which he integrated that understanding into the development of his psychology. And what's interesting is that not only did astrology greatly influence Jung, but Jungian psychology has in turn come to shape much of modern Western astrology particularly his notion of synchronicity, which is certainly fundamental to archetypal astrology, psychological astrology, because synchronicity is one of the concepts by which contemporary astrologers can understand how astrology works. Of course, this would be a really interesting to d discussion to have in relation to, um, say, traditional astrology or other lineages and branches of astrology. I'm genuinely curious what the perspective is on the notion of synchronicity. So the idea of synchronicity is that it's a coincidence between an inner and an outer event, a meaningful coincidence between an inner and outer event. And we've all experienced these in our lives, right? You're thinking of something and then something happens in the external world that symbolically uh, reflects what's been going on for you. And in that way, astrology is also like a synchronicity because we could say that the, the planets and their positions are not physically causing the events that unfold on earth. Rather, they're correlating with those events. So to, to use a, a metaphor for that, it's like the planets can be understood like the hands of a clock. When the clock says that it's 7 p.m., the clock isn't causing it to be 7 p.m. It's simply correlating with that. It's reflecting that reality. So one could understand the movement of the planets in a similar way, that their positions indicate the quality of time in the human experience and that their movements chase the trace these ever-changing dynamics in individual human lives and in the larger patterns of collective experience in history so we could say that astrology itself is a continuously ongoing universally visible form of synchronicity a correlation between inner experience and an outer event. So to, we can see in that how Jungian, uh, Jungian psychology has also influenced how modern astrology, at least, is understood and practiced just at the same time as astrology itself was informing Jung's depth psychology. Now, the second volume published by Liz Green on this subject, it's titled The Astrological World of Jung's Liber Novus. And again, Liber Novus is the, actually the proper title for the Red Book, Daemons, Gods, and the Planetary Journey. And I'll be exploring the content of this text a little later on so that we can go into more detail. But 
first I want to turn toward the world transits. So the world transits that were in the sky at the time that Jung's fantasy visions began. And I want to look at this first because it's really a means of understanding the, the archetypal zeitgeist, the quality of the, that moment in time. So for those who are maybe less familiar with astrological language, I know most of you are probably very deeply engaged in astrological techniques, but for those who aren't as much, um, world transits, they're the positions of the planets at any given time. And their alignments correlate with the unfolding patterns of history. So world transits, which also go by the name of mundane astrology or worldly astrology is another term for it. It's particularly illuminating when one looks at the positions of the outer planets. So Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And the reason is because as these planets are further out in our solar system, they move more slowly than the inner planets. And their alignments will last for several years. So each time two or more planets come into a given alignment, we can see in history the repetition of themes that correlate with the archetypal qualities associated with those planets. So the most significant planetary alignment that correlated with Jung's Red Book period is an opposition between the planets Uranus and Neptune. And this opposition, it was quite a long one because both Uranus and Neptune moved quite slowly. So they were in 180 degree opposition from 1899 all the way until 1918. And they were fairly close at the time that Jung's Red Book period began, because you can see that's in the middle part of those years, kind of the latter part, but toward the middle. So just to speak a little bit about the archetypes that are associated with these two planets, the, the archetypes are the qualities or the characteristics associated with Neptune and with Uranus. Neptune symbolizes the transcendent. It's imaginative and spiritual vision. It's the realm of the ideal. Neptune relates to enchantment and to magic. It's the poetic vision or the fantasy. It's mysticism, but it's also illusion. It's the image, right? It's the wellspring of images. So it can be illusion or delusion the mirage, it can be madness. It's Neptune is the stream of consciousness, the unconscious, it's dreams, it's visions, fantasies, images, reflections, it's watery. So all of these qualities are, have that kind of flowing, merging, dissolving, watery quality to them. And then in contrast, in terms of quality, Uranus, the archetype of Uranus has to do with change, with rebellion, with revolution, with disruption, with freedom and liberation. It breaks through. It is connected to surprise, to awakening, to sudden revelation. It's lightning quick. So it's Uranus is innovation. It's genius. It's that spark of creativity or originality, the, the aha moment, the light bulb going off over your head. Now, when you bring these two together, as we saw at the beginning of the 20th century, your honest Neptune periods tend to correlate with times of spiritual awakening. Neptune brings the spirituality and religion. Uranus brings the awakening, the birth of new philosophies, there can be a sudden shift in cosmological or metaphysical vision. It can be a time of a rebirth of idealism or an awakening of the imagination 
the cultural artistic imagination, for example, or an awakening of the individual imagination. It's time, a time period of spiritual or cosmic epiphany of new forms of artistic expression, bringing forward in new ways that imaginative vision. And when we look at that 1899 to 1918 opposition of Uranus and Neptune, if you look at that time in history, we can see that it really was a time of searching for spiritual renewal. There was this kind of cultural movement of searching for that spiritual renewal. And contemporaries of Jung's were also having fantasy visions and writing and painting them, being connected to that stream of consciousness. If you look at the art or the literature from that period, it's all reflective of these qualities. The editor of Jung's Red Book, Sonu Shamdasani, who has my utmost respect because he spent 13 years editing and compiling and aiding in the translation of the Red Book. Sonu Shamdasani wrote the introduction to the Red Book. And he said of this time period, not having anything to do with astrology when he's saying this, he said, on all sides, individuals were searching for new forms with which to depict the actualities of inner experience in a quest for spiritual and cultural renewal. So you can hear the Uranus-Neptune themes here. Neptune is coming through in the spiritual um, and cultural side of things, the inner experience, the experience of the psyche, of the imagination. And you see Uranus coming through in the searching for new forms or the renewal or rebirth side of things. Jung also said something of that time period, which as well carries those Uranus-Neptune archetypal themes. He said, our age is seeking a new spring of life. I found one and drank of it and the water tasted good. Just even the watery imagery is so fitting of Neptune. This new spring of life is such a Uranus-Neptune image, bringing the newness of Uranus and even the word spring kind of carries both that Uranus-Neptune quality, that it, it is water in that Neptunian sense, but it's the Uranian, the sudden emergence of the spring. So clearly this was informing the, the zeitgeist uh, of that current moment when Jung was beginning to have, to awaken to these fantasies, awaken to these visions, the way they kind of erupted into his consciousness. And one of the primary themes of the Red Book is the rebirth of God in the soul. And again, you can hear those Uranus-Neptune themes. Neptune is spirituality, religion, God, as well as the soul, fantasy, and imagination. And rebirth, that correlates with the archetype of Uranus. And that's really one of the major themes that we see in Jung's Red Book. It's a descent into the underworld, and it is a rebirth of God through fantasy, through the imagination. Now, interestingly, Uranus and Neptune, they've actually come together in major quadrature alignment just two other times in the 20th century, in the decade of the 1950s and the decade of the 1990s. All these qualities I've been describing are relevant to the, the 1950s and the 1990s. And while I won't unpack that on a larger cultural scale, I will speak a little bit about how it's connected to Jung. Because in the 1950s, Jung wrote the culminating texts of his career that were actually intimately linked to the content of the Red Book. And for those of you who are familiar with Jung's works, you may recognize these titles. These four books are Aeon, Answer to Job, and Mysterium Conjunctionis, and Psychology of the Transference. And these four books are what the scholar Lance Owens calls Jung's 
summary quartet. They're summing up his life work. And each one is connected to the content of the Red Book. But he's writing about it in a way that's more accessible to the psychological audience that he was, um, that he was writing for. So three out of those four were published in the 1950s. Um, the first book of the quartet, Psychology of the Transference, was published in 1946, just as the Uranus-Neptune alignment was beginning to come into its significant orb of influence. So all of them are being, uh, are kind of within the, the archetypal realm of Uranus and Neptune. So it, I find it fascinating that Jung returned to the themes that were present in Liber Novus decades later. And it's almost like he was waiting for the archetypal configuration of Uranus with Neptune that had been in the sky when he first had the fantasy visions beginning in 1913. Now, although Jung was practicing astrology, I really don't think he was you know, intentionally waiting for this alignment to return. I think this is another example of the way of the kind of unconscious cosmic orchestration that we see lying behind the unfolding patterns of history and, of course, our individual lives. So the, the next alignment of Uranus and Neptune came in the 1990s. And this happened to be the decade when Jung's heirs finally agreed to the publication of the Red Book. As I mentioned, it wasn't finished. It was locked away in a Swiss bank vault for decades. And it really seemed unlikely that it would ever be published. And yet it was in the 1990s that at last a convincing argument was brought forward primarily by Sonu Shandasani, the editor, saying that this really should be brought forward and it should be brought forward in a way that really honors the material and the, the form that Jung originally depicted it in, which is why it is this massive um, manuscript, this beautiful tome with the illustrations and it's um, a facsimile edition. So it was in the 90s under the next Uranus-Neptune alignment that the decision was made to publish the Red Book at last. So we can see this kind of diachronic patterning through the 20th century in which the same archetypal themes return each time these two planets, Uranus and Neptune, come into alignment with each other. And even though the Red Book was finally published, it wasn't until 2009, a decade ago now, that it was still in the mid-90s that Sonu Shamdasani began that long task of compiling and editing and working with the translators. He began that in the mid nineties. So the red book really does carry the archetypal stamp of that period, just as it of course carries the archetypal qualities of the period in which Jung was, was writing it. Now, while I would say that the Uranus Neptune transit may be perhaps the most significant for understanding the archetypal conditions under which Jung's Red Book was produced, there are, of course, other alignments to consider as well. One of the major ones was the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that occurred in 1914 in exact correlation with the start of the First World War. Saturn-Pluto alignments tend to correlate with periods of intense crisis, division, contraction, uh, often leading to personal, national, and international conflict and division, othering, seeing the other as enemy. And the archetypal themes of Saturn-Pluto relate to facing the shadow, both within oneself and in the collective. And if we look at the last century or so, Saturn-Pluto alignments have correlated with all the major conflicts that have taken place 
around the world. For example, the First World War began under a Saturn-Pluto conjunction. The Second World War began under a Saturn-Pluto square. The Cold War began under a Saturn-Pluto conjunction. The Vietnam War began under a Saturn-Pluto opposition. 9-11 took place under a Saturn-Pluto opposition. And I will mention that today we find ourselves in yet another Saturn-Pluto period, a conjunction that started in 2018 and it'll last until about 2021. It comes into exact alignment for the first time on January 12th of 2020. So coming up very soon. And I can imagine that all of you in different ways can feel that heaviness, that darkness, that division in the collective, and perhaps also feeling it in your personal lives in some way as well. Now, Saturn-Pluto alignments don't always correlate with global warfare, although that is a potential under such alignments. We're often confronted with themes of survival, when Saturn and Pluto come together in the sky. One way that I see the Saturn-Pluto conjunction manifesting now in our current era is the new awareness, or the new level of awareness at least, of the climate crisis and mass extinction that is really kind of coming into the collective consciousness in a new way. Of course, these crises have been developing for decades, but it seems to have taken on an urgency since Saturn and Pluto came into alignment, an urgency that I, I feel like we haven't really felt before. And sometimes knowing that an alignment such as Saturn, Pluto is in the sky, sometimes it can inspire feelings of fear, especially when we do see how such alignments have correlated with wars and crises and other conflicts in the past. But I also feel like that astrological knowledge provides us with an opportunity. I mentioned that Saturn Pluto, one of the themes is about facing the shadow, both collectively and within. And that the more we each do our deep inner work of withdrawing our projections and shining a light on the hidden dark regions of who we are the less likely this is to manifest in the external world. We're given a fortitude and a moral ethos to face the unfolding in the collective. And we can recognize that it's really powerful archetypal movements that are here at work that are moving through us. And also one gift of astrology too is that we can also trust that these periods will come to an end. They always do. This too shall pass. So as we're looking at this time period in Jung's life and when he was creating the Red Book and having these visions of a devastating flood covering all of Europe and he's having this sense of something dire unfolding in the collective, well, we're in a very similar moment archetypally, and we're living under uh, the same Saturn-Pluto conjunction as was in the sky then. Now, moving to Jung's birth chart, and while we're still speaking about this theme of Saturn-Pluto, Jung himself was born with a Saturn-Pluto square in his chart. There's a 90 degree angle between these two planets that you can see. Here's Saturn in Aquarius making a 90 degree square to Pluto in Taurus. And he was a master of knowing what it meant to face the shadow because he'd done it himself. He'd done it through his Red Book experiences, and he guided so many patients through that process as well. We even get that term, the shadow, from Jung, of course. Now, another part of Jung's birth chart that is especially relevant to what we're discussing here is his son Neptune square. And you can see here is his son at the descendant, 
in Leo and it's making an exact square to Neptune. And we've, I've already been talking about those qualities, those archetypal qualities of Neptune. The sun is who we are as an individual. It's our autonomous identity. It's what we shine as in the world. It's what we name ourselves, what we call ourselves. It's the part of us that says, I am, I exist. It's our will to be. It's the personal. And the fact that Jung is born with a sun-Neptune square in his chart, he is an individual whose identity was permeable to, to the spiritual, to the archetypal, to the symbolic. He had a kind of permeability of identity to those things this personal exploration of the archetypal realm, for example. Also, his later understanding of the self as an archetype is very reflective of that Sun-Neptune alignment in his chart. So Jung's whole psychology is reflective of his natal chart, as is the psychology of any great psychologist. It's reflective of their natal chart or any philosopher or any artist or politician. So we can see his psychology coming through in the archetypes as they're configured in his natal chart. His lifelong effort to bring individual consciousness, which we can think of in that more, that solar sense, and the archetypal unconscious, which we can think of in that Neptunian sense, bringing those two into a fruitful relationship. This also is so expressive of his son, Neptune Square. This, I would say, is maybe the main character of his birth chart, if we were to approach it in that way. This is the protagonist of who he was. So it's significant to see what how the world transits at the time of Jung's Red Book period were interacting with his natal chart. So if we look here at the time that the Red Book was beginning when he was getting his first visions, let me point out to you. So the inner wheel is Jung's birth chart. The outer wheel is where the planets were. At the time of his first most fully immersive uh, active imagination fantasy. And we can see that his son, Neptune, square, which his son, I should mention, it's on the descendant. Uh, he was born right at sunset. The Uranus-Neptune opposition that is dancing, you know, in, an, um, in closer and wider orb over those years that I mentioned, that Uranus-Neptune opposition is right there on his ascendant, descendant axis and on his sun. At this point, at the beginning of the Red Book period, Neptune was just coming into orb with his sun. It had actually it had come in closer earlier in that year. It's retrograde at this time. And then the whole thing is T-squaring his natal Neptune. So what that indicates is a profound interaction and activation between the world transits of the Uranus Neptune, that cultural and spiritual awakening, the awakening of the imagination, and how personally it happened for Jung, that it's crossing his son at this time, and really leading to both a liberation and a dissolution of his identity. Remember, he thought he was going mad. And then came to realize that there was something so much larger coming through him. And this alignment, Uranus opposite Neptune on his sun Neptune square is reflective of that, this liberation of his identity as he goes into this um, descent into the world of images, into the world of the imagination. So to go again to the beginning of his Red Book experiences, I keep mentioning this flood vision. And it took place October 17th 
of 1913. And the way Jung described this, he said, in October, while I was alone on a journey, I was suddenly seized by an overpowering vision. I saw a monstrous flood covering all the northern and low-lying lands between the North Sea and the Alps. I saw the mighty yellow waves, the floating rubble of civilization, and the drowned bodies of countless thousands. Then the whole sea turned to blood. So this vision came to him while he was on a train journey. And two weeks later, he had the vision again. And this time it was accompanied by a voice saying, look at it well. It is wholly real and it will be so. You cannot doubt this. So this is the vision that really inaugurated his whole Red Book period, turned him toward engaging in active imagination, really trying to figure out what was happening to him. And if we look at the transits for when that occurred, again, the main thing that I want to emphasize is that that Uranus-Neptune opposition is on his ascendant-descendant and crossing his Sun-Neptune square. But there's something else happening here too. There's so many different things we could explore and unpack around any one of these transits for any one of these visions or dreams or active imagination fantasies. But the one that I want to emphasize here is that Saturn was in opposition at that time to his natal Mars. It was opposite his Mars throughout that year. And if we think of the qualities of Mars, particularly as it relates to war, to blood, to violence, and then Saturn as it relates to death, this is a vision of death. It's a vision of Europe being covered by a flood of blood. And that vision is itself so expressive of those archetypal qualities associated with Mars and with Saturn. At the same time as it's a suddenly erupting vision, as is fitting for Uranus with Neptune. So after Jung had these two flood visions, he returned to his journal and he'd abandoned his journal in 1902 when he got married. So in some ways he'd abandoned that more introspective way of being and self-reflecting. So he comes back to his journal and as he begins to write in the journal, which is the first of what Jung scholars call the black books, he starts to call to his soul. Night after night, he's calling to his soul. And this is what we can read in the first few chapters of the Red Book, is Jung calling to his soul, seeking after his soul. And this began in November 14th of 1913, this searching for soul. He realized he had lost his soul somewhere in the time where he'd been focused on outer things, on professional development and being connected to the outer world and other people, but he'd lost connection to the inner world, to his soul. And something that's kind of interesting is that in November of 1913, as he's calling to his soul, as he's returning to his journal, he the transit that he was getting at that time was Mercury entering into a T-square with his son Neptune. So Mercury is a fairly fast moving planet. And at the time that he takes up the journal, takes up writing and starts calling to his soul, Mercury is crossing his son Neptune, which it just feels so fitting for what that experience is, turning to writing, turning to language in order to come back into relationship with the Neptunian soul. He had the, he described his experience during that month of, as being like wandering in the desert because he's calling for the soul and yet he's not seeing anything. He's not hearing anything. There's no response. He really doesn't know what's going on. It's a very confusing time period for him. And yet he keeps staying with it for 25 nights. 
he feels as though he's wandering in the desert of soul. And then finally, he has this fully immersive breakthrough vision that takes place on December 12th, 1913. This is an illustration that he did of part of the vision that's in the Red Book. And he says, I was sitting at my desk once more, thinking over my fears. Then I let myself drop. Suddenly, it was as though the ground literally gave way beneath my feet. And I plunged down into dark depths. After a while, my eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, which was rather like a deep twilight. Before me was the entrance to a dark cave in which stood a dwarf with a leathery skin, as if he were mummified. I squeezed past him through the narrow entrance and waded knee-deep through icy water to the other end of the cave where, on a projecting rock, I saw a glowing red crystal. I grasped the stone, lifted it, and discovered a hollow underneath. At first, I could make out nothing, but then I saw that there was running water, a gigantic black scarab, and then a red newborn sun rising up out of the depths of the water. So this is an extraordinary breakthrough vision that comes to him. And for those of you who've heard me talk about the parallels between Jung's Red Book and Tolkien's Red Book, or if you're even familiar with The Lord of the Rings or the other of others of Tolkien's work, you may be feeling a few echoes here in this vision of some Tolkienian themes. I'm not going to go into that now. But I want to look at the transits of this first vision that he recorded in the Red Book. Again, we still have the Uranus-Neptune on the sun. That's going to be there throughout these years. That's the dominant theme. But there's also a Mars-Neptune conjunction that we can see here. Mars is coming in to join. It's five degrees away um, to join Neptune. And Mars, again, it brings the, the themes of blood, of violence. There's in that vision, it's not part of the quote I read, it's a much longer vision, but there's a murdered hero that he sees. That's what you can see in the image where there's the body floating by with the blood on his head. The murdered hero, also the image of the red sun. These are Martian colors, red, um, the themes of blood connected to Mars, but it's all in this watery Neptunian environment let alone the fact it's in a vision, which is, of course, also reflective of Neptune. And furthermore, carrying forward these Martian themes, the sun in the sky is conjunct Jung's natal, Nep uh, natal Mars. And so again, that emphasis, the prevalence of blood, the murdered hero, the sun is the really kind of the symbol of the hero. and also, finally, just the image at the end of the red sun. And so quite literally, the sun, and it's, it's red. It's stained with that Martian blood in that way. And that's a, a very tight alignment um, that would have been exact the very next day. So throughout December of 1913, Jung is engaging in active imagination pretty much every night, um, this is the majority of the first part of the Red Book that, that's recorded at this time. And then as we move into January of 1914, other things are happening. For example, January 2nd, 1914, Jung has this profound vision of death, yet another uh, vision of a, a great wave or flood of death, this bloody wave. He again has the vision of the red sun. Interestingly, by January 2nd, Mars and the sun were opposite each other in the world transits. So the two visions that have the red sun for Jung take place first when the sun is on his Mars, and then the second time it happens is when the sun is opposite Mars in the world transits. Now, as he kept going, 
through these experiences, Jung met figures. He met um, what I call imaginal figures. And these are people he encountered in the unconscious. And that in itself is a whole rich discussion. Are these facets of Jung's personality? Are they parts of his own psyche? Are they collective um, archetypal beings? Um, I have about 10,000 theories on that, which maybe we can get into in the Q&A or at least a little bit of it. I personally feel that they are co-creations. So they are expressions of the archetypes that take on a guise that comes from our an action, our co-creative engagement with them. So they're neither fully personal nor fully or only collective. They're both. Um, but that's maybe another discussion for another time. The most important of these figures, who Jung talked about outside of the Red Book, if you read Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is essentially his autobiography, he speaks about this figure Philemon. Philemon means loving one. And Philemon was like an internal guide who came to Jung. He's a, he first comes in the form of a magician. And he's this wise old man who offers guidance and wisdom and is really a teacher to Jung, a guru to Jung, as he would later come to describe him. And he becomes a very prominent figure in the Red Book. And Jung first encountered him on January 27th, 1914. He first came in a dream, actually, and then he encountered him in one of his active imagination fantasies. He met him in a garden. It's a beautiful meeting. Again, just to briefly reference some parallels with Tolkien, Philemon's like Gandalf. He's, he's the wise old man archetype but he's also a particular figure. He's got these, you know, gray, gray white hair and beard. He's got these bright, glowing, alive eyes. This is an, uh, an illustration that Jung created of Philemon. He has these kingfisher wings sometimes. He doesn't always have the wings. And he came to Jung when there was a, a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction that was in the sky. And that Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, it started in December of 1913. It lasted through January of 1915. So it's about 14 months. And I do find it really significant that that Jupiter-Uranus alignment correlated with the the majority of the fantasies that Jung experienced. Because Jupiter Uranus, when they come into alignment with each other in the world transits, it tends to correlate with sudden breakthroughs, whether it's scientific or artistic or technological. It's that kind of sudden, exciting, liberating, expansive, jovial, celebratory energy. And that Jupiter Uranus conjunction was starting to come into tighter orb in January of 1914 when Philemon first appeared. But that's not the only, yes, his appearance is a major breakthrough in terms of Jung's psychological process, his confrontation with the unconscious, but Philemon has so much more to him. And I take the date that he first appeared as being something like a birth chart. And if we look at that, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, there is this extraordinary stellium, all in Aquarius, of Jupiter, Venus, the sun, Uranus, Mercury, and the moon. He came in uh, just past the new moon. All of those other planets had joined the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction that's just six degrees apart at this point. And he is a solar figure. He is a representative of the higher self in that way, or the self, to use Jung's archetypal terminology. And his teachings, they brought tremendous new insight and awakening, as is fitting for the Jupiter Uranus, and with Mercury in there as well. And it's communicated with 
with love, with compassion, with wisdom, as is so fitting of having Venus in there and Jupiter in there. So this stellium is just beautiful. I mean, imagine um, a living, breathing, and fleshed human being born with this birth chart. So this is Philemon's birth chart. But if we see it in relation to Jung's chart, it just takes the whole thing to another level. Because that whole stellium in Aquarius is filling Jung's first house and it's conjunct his ascendant. Um, it's really just filling that whole range between his ascendant degree and his Saturn. It's all in Aquarius. And using traditional rulerships, as Jung would have, uh, Aquarius is ruled by Saturn. And so all of these planets, this full stellium, is in the, a sign ruled by Saturn. And Philemon is most definitely a beautiful Saturnian figure. He is that wise old man, the Senex, the bringer and bearer of wisdom. Um, so the fact that that whole stellium is in Aquarius on Jung's ascendant, I think is just exquisitely beautiful. So this is maybe a good moment to turn toward the research that Liz Green did, focusing on the Red Book. And she makes a highly convincing argument that Jung used astrology to interpret his fantasy experiences that he recorded in the Red Book. So while astrology may not have been at the forefront of his consciousness during the experiences themselves, when he was writing the secondary commentary, or what Sonu Shamdasani calls the lyrical elaboration, he was consciously employing astrological symbolism as a means to understand what was unfolding for him, right? He's trying to make sense of these often confusing, deeply profound, totally immersive fantasies. And astrology, it seems, was one of the ways that he did that. So not only can the different imaginal figures that he encountered be correlated with particular planetary and also zodiacal archetypes, but what's amazing is that their specific expressions also reflect Jung's birth chart configurations. So through an astrological lens, we can see how the Red Book is simultaneously a highly individual and yet also a universal work, just like astrology is. It uses universal symbols to describe highly specific and individual expressions of being. Now, if you haven't read the Red Book, this won't carry as much meaning for you because you haven't yet, in, it's like talking about a story you haven't read, you haven't encountered Isdubar and Salome and Elijah and Philemon. They're wonderful to meet. So I highly recommend reading the Red Book. And I can speak about these imaginal figures that Jung encountered by using this astrological language. It actually gives us a glimpse of, of who they are. So I'll just move through some of the different figures and their astrological correlates that Liz Green identified. And I'll just reemphasize that this research is taken from Liz Green's work, The Astrological World of Jung's Liber Novus, this, this last section of my presentation. So she talks about how a few different figures, the red one, the devil, and also Siegfried the hero, that Jung encounters, how they are expressions of Mars. And we get to see these different permutations of Mars coming through in them. And Jung working to integrate his Mars and Sagittarius through these different figures as they appear. The red one, who Jung identifies as the devil at one point, 
although he denies he's the devil. He presents himself as joy. And how fitting that the devilish red one who calls himself joy, that that would be an expression of Mars in Sagittarius. If we look to some of the solar symbolism, first of all, it's really worth paying attention when you read the Red Book to the solar landscapes. When are the landscapes in full sun, like the desert scenes, for example? And when are they, in, when are they lunar scenes? When are they at night illuminated by the cold sheen of the moon? They have very different qualities. And the symbolism of the solar and the lunar archetypes come through each of these scenes in those specific ways. But there's also a few different figures who are expressive of the solar archetype. For example, the god Isdubar, I'll show you here. That's how he first appears to Jung on the left. And Jung has this profound encounter with Isdubar, where Isdubar is heading west. He is seeking the sun, the immortal lands, because he wants to become immortal. And Jung, when he encounters him, he says, well, the sun doesn't set in the West. We live on a globe that is moving through space and the sun is millions of miles away. And as a mythological, fantastical figure, that knowledge wounds Istubar. He is mortally wounded. And so there's this whole profound sequence that takes place where Jung ends up convincing Istubar that he is a fantasy. And as a fantasy, Jung is able to carry him on his back, carry him down the mountainside, put him in an egg in this pocket, and bring him into this home where he chants over the egg. And then Isdubar is reborn as a solar god. And that's the image you're seeing on the right, the egg breaking open and the god being reborn as the sun. So this extraordinary solar imagery, which also reflects the journey of the sun, who dies into the west night after night, and then is reborn each morning in the east. You can also see something that Liz Green points out, that those salamanders that are behind Isdubar, that they're actually shaped kind of like the glyph for Leo. Leo ruled by the sun. The salamander is an alchemical symbol uh, of fire and the sun. The salamanders run through the fire. Uh, so there are all these different astrological symbols that are embedded throughout the, both the text and especially the illustrations in the Red Book. So the, the lunar figures are... Uh, there's a great variety of lunar figures. There's the scholar's daughter. There's the cook. Uh, there, most significantly, is the woman Salome. She is an anima figure. She is someone who is carrying, in relation to Jung, that symbol of the soul. And this is a whole facet of Jung's psychology that we could go into more deeply. But it's the idea that within us, we have we have our opposite and for jung as a man he saw that his opposite was uh was a young woman was what he called the anima which is the uh, latin word for soul and she is a lunar figure in that way turning now to saturn he encounters a few quite a few different figures actually who are expressions of saturn the prophet Elijah, who in Jung's fantasies is the father of Salome, they are paired together in this syzygy. The old scholar, the anchorite, the librarian, and the professor, there are all these different facets of the Saturnian archetype that show up. And most importantly, of course, is Philemon, who I've already talked about. These are all different expressions of Saturn. Now, why is Saturn so important for Jung? Well, if you recall in his birth chart, he has, he has Aquarius rising, ruled by Saturn. And so in that way, Saturn is, the, is ruling his chart. It, it, and he saw himself as a very Saturnian figure. Uh, 
This was the planetary archetype that he worked with and wrestled with throughout his life. And so Saturn is a dominant theme in his life, in his psychology, and of course, in the Red Book. And it's most specifically embodied by Philemon, but also this whole range of, of different imaginal figures. Um, another expression of the sun is Phanes, who is the divine child, the bringer of the sun. So you can see there's such a rich world here that could be su such a deep dive to go into. And I could not recommend more highly uh, reading Liz Green's books and exploring this uh, more deeply for yourself. The last significant part of Jung's Red Book that Liz Green analyzes is the first mandala he ever painted. And it's called Systema Munditosius. And it's the, it's the world, the total world system. And it was created in 1916 in tandem with Septum Sermons Ad Mortuos, the Seven Sermons to the Dead. And the mandala for Jung, it's a symbol of individuation. It's a symbol of coming back to the self, the psychological individuation journey. And this mandala is an image of Jung's psychocosmology. So in some ways, it's, it's a universally applicable symbol, and yet it's also reflected through the lens of his birth chart. So again, we could probably spend an entire talk just unpacking all the symbols in this extraordinary painting that Jung created. But I just want to point out, first of all, that it's oriented, it is uh, in the same shape as an astrological mandala, as a birth chart, with the quadratures, with the upper and lower realms, with the east and the west, the rising and the setting. And actually, this symbol at the top of the candelabra with the, um, the six candles on each side and then the one in the center, that is an ancient symbol for the seven planets, the seven ancient planets. So he's put that right there. And actually, there is uh, an earlier version of this drawing. This is the, the final version, um, the painted version. But there's a diagram that he created first. And this is what Liz Green really goes deeply into studying. Because as the original prototype of the Sistema, that diagram contains astrological glyphs, unlike the Sistema. So he sketched it out with all of this astrological information. And then when he made the complete version that would eventually become public, he took out those symbols and rather replaced them with different images or less uh, astrologically obvious expressions. So just briefly to go into what we see here, uh, you see several polarities. First of all, in the upper half, you have the spiritual realm or the heavenly or celestial realm. You see Fana is the divine child right there at the top with his wings. You have the winged serpent and the winged mouse on either side as symbols of uh, science and art. And then in the lower half, you have the underworld. You have the material realm as symbolized by the tree of life, by the god Abraxas, who is a, a Gnostic god that Jung learns about in the Seven Sermons to the Dead. And, and then, of course, you have the other axis in here, the, uh, the east-west axis, or the realm of darkness and the realm of light. And this is one of the places where Liz Green feels that this is an expression of Jung's birth chart. Because by having the realm of darkness in the east to the left, it seems a little counterintuitive. We would think of the east as, you know, it's the rising. It's the, it's the solar place. Um, it's the, it, literally, it's the place of light. And yet in this depiction, Jung has made it darkness. And Liz Green feels that maybe one of the reasons for that is because in Jung's birth chart, 
with Aquarius rising, that's the Saturnian realm. And so it's the dark realm. And that's why he's had the, he sets the darkness in the East to the left. And then with the, the right-hand side of the mandala, the, the Western side, that's the realm of light. And why would Jung do that? Well, again, if you recall, he was born with the sun setting, the sun in Leo setting. And so it's the setting sun that illuminates the Western sky for Jung personally. But he's put this into this more universal symbol that he's created. So what, what astrology provides us, especially when we turn it toward Jung's psychology and Jung's Red Book, astrology itself is the art of seeing universals expressed and manifested through particular individuals. And here in the symbol, we see the intersection of personal and universal. We're all born with the same planets in our natal charts, but we all have them in unique configurations. So as individuals, we're like a nexus point and we're holding together these universal patterns in a configuration that is actually specific and unique to us. I've, one thing that I really appreciate about Liz Green's interpretations, her astrological interpretations of Jung's Red Book is that they don't reduce his experiences, but rather they illuminate them further. You don't r read through and go, oh, well, um, Philemon is Saturn, the red one is Mars, Salome is the moon, and they're, they're kind of flattened with this archetypal reductionism. Rather, her analysis beautifully illuminates these figures further. We can actually see more of who they are. And what Jung's relationship was to them. So nothing collapses in this kind of analysis. It, it simply points us toward the fullness of the archetypes who stand behind the imaginal figures that Jung is encountering in his fantasies and his visions. So really we're able to see the red one in a new way when we see him as an expression of Mars or Isdubar as an expression of the solar archetype. Salome and the girl in the castle is the moon. We can see the multivalence of the archetype of Saturn as it comes through the anchorite or the old scholar or the librarian or the professor or the prophet Elijah and of course, most importantly, Philemon. And Again, just to reemphasize, the analysis of Jung's mandala, Systema Munditosius, that Green undertakes, it's not only an expression of Jung's universal psychocosmology, but it's also an expression of his own personal birth chart. And I really actually feel that this may be the most valuable section in her book doing this analysis. It's just extraordinary how much she unpacks there. And one of the most important themes that Green speaks to is the idea that the figures who appear in the imaginal realm are daemons rather than individual personality traits. So in this way, Liz Green is in agreement with James Hillman and others who see these figures as not being reduced to the individual experiencing them. Rather, they are universals. And this provides us with some other language to overcome what James Hillman calls the personalistic fallacy. So for example, we can speak of the positions of Venus or the Sun or Saturn in our birth charts, but we cannot or maybe we should not speak of my Venus, my Sun, my Saturn. Rather, we all have Venus, the Sun, Saturn, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, the other planetary archetypes living through us. We're participating in universals rather than owning them in this more individualistic way. So the astrological system can provide 
an essential interpretive lens to the experiences that Jung had during his Red Book period, as Green demonstrates, and also as I've shown with the transits and Jung's natal chart and so far, so forth. The archetypes associated with the planets appear to Jung as the figures of the imaginal realm. So they reflect these universal themes and they reflect his personal birth chart. So on that note, uh, I want to bring this to a close. I want to uh, open up for dialogue, for any questions. Um, I've seen that the, the chat box is filling and I look forward to seeing what is being discussed there. And I just want to end on this one last statement. And that is that Jung advised us each to make our own red book from the fantasies that emerge to us through dream, through active imagination in whatever form. He says, make your own red book and return to it like you would to a sanctuary or a cathedral for your soul is within its pages. So on that note, um, I will bring this to a close and let's now turn to having some dialogue. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Becca. That was fantastic. Um, just amazing. I'm going to just um, pop into the chat box here and okay. see if we have a few questions from Betty. Um, do you have a source or sources you'd recommend that explore Jung's roots in Neoplatonism, including post-Renaissance Neoplatonic thinkers who predated Jung? I'm very interested in these connections. That's a very specific question. I, I kind of feel like Becca can definitely handle that, though. So, um, I, I feel like in about a year, I'll be able to handle that one better because <laughs> that's something I'm really interested in. Um, I actually, you know, Liz Green would be able to answer that question. And so if you do read her books, she is talking about the connections to, um, to Neoplatonism. She talks about how active imagination is an ancient practice, a theurgic practice. Um, so I would say start with her and dig through her bibliography um, because that will give you a lot. I would also say, um, and Adam, maybe you agree with me here, look to James Hillman because he's drawing on Ficino and um, everyone who's informing um, Marsilio Ficino in the Renaissance. And that's also coming out of some Neoplatonic roots. Um, yeah. yeah, I think there's, there's a book that comes to my mind and I'm going to forget, I want to call it The Lament of the Dead. Is that the name of it, Becca? It's so good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a dialogue between James Hillman and Sonu Shamdasani. If you want one book that just beautifully discusses the Red Book and is very accessible, The Lament of the Dead is the way to go. The reason that I also brought that up was that I believe there might be some, I seem to recall some referencing of Ficino in that text, but I could be wrong about that because um, sometimes they all run together for me. The other book that I would recommend though is there's a collection of essays in, I believe they're called the Uniform Editions and um, I have it on my shelf actually. And it's uh, um, Hillman's Alchemical Psychology which is another good one that has, I think a, there's a, if you like the territory we're in tonight and you're also thinking of kind of crossing over to Hillman, Betty, who was obviously, he, he, he definitely spends a lot of time talking about um, Ficino and Ficino's connection to Platonism, Neoplatonism and things like that. Um, uh, but that book, Alchemical Psychology has a lot in common, that collection of essays, Alchemical Psychology also has a lot in common with um, Jung's, Red Book. It it goes into similar like amazing esoteric imaginative territory. Something that is interesting. Um, a lot of people, maybe not a lot of people, a number of people thought that James Hillman must have had access to the Red Book because a lot of the critiques that he brings forward to Jung are actually critiques that were brought to Jung by the imaginal figures he encountered. Huh. like Elijah and Salome and Philemon. And I think it was Sonu Shamdasani who asked him in uh, Lament of the Dead, did you have access to this? Or I thought you had access to this. 
So Hillman was tapping into the same knowledge source that Jung was, but actually took it more seriously um, because Jung doesn't always do the things that these imaginal figures are suggesting maybe would be a good idea for him to do. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, I feel like um, there's so many, I have so many questions, but I'm going to, I'm not going to hog it. Let's see what, who else, let's see. I'm, I'm going back up. Uh, do you consider the ninth house transit sun Jupiter conjunction as part of the flood vision? Mm. Um, yeah, let's go back to that if we can, just to see it. Um, and I will say that I'm not, there it is. Um, uh, right. The sun crossing his Jupiter. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the fact that it was exact that day and that, um, it is taking place in that kind of prominent, um, spiritual, religious, visionary place, house, um, it does feel significant. I mean, really, we could take any one of these transits and any one of the visions and just look at every single facet of it um, to really get a deeper sense. And the fact that Sun, Jupiter, uh, that he was having that transit, it really speaks to um, the, the broad vision the illumination that took place. And the way he describes this, he talked about it again and again in, um, in the Red Book and Memory Streams Reflections and seminars, what the vision looked like. And he's getting an aerial view of Europe. He's seeing the full map of Europe in relief. And so if you think of that Jupiterian mountaintop vision, um, it, it is really fitting for that. You can't get, you really can't get more visionary than the, uh, than the Uranus opposite sun square Neptune all at once. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this is crazy. I love it. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay. As Jung was tapping into the realms concurrently and synchronistically at the same or similar time as Tolkien, sounds like the same took place for Hillman. Mm. Comment there. Um, I don't, oh, Actually, there was another question up here. Franklin says, Becca used the term fantasy, and can we differentiate the idea of Coleridge's fantasy and Corban's imaginal realm? This is exactly what I wrote my dissertation about. <laughs> um, so the, the term fantasy has so many definitions for so many different people. So you have to be really careful how you use it. And I didn't kind of go through and give a very clear definition of terms here. Um, and what the way that Jung would use that term is really speaking to uh, the emergence of, of these visions and, and that those are fantasies. So what active imagination shows us is a fantasy. Um, in terms of Coleridge, so um, let me see how easily and quickly I can do this. Um, Coleridge speaks about the primary imagination and the secondary imagination. And then he also speaks about this idea of fancy. And as Tolkien likes to point out, fancy is just a degraded uh, form of the word fantasy. And Tolkien really wants to reclaim the word fantasy. Um, so Tolkien actually has this whole kind of invisible dialogue with Coleridge about these terms and it's wonderfully nitpicky and I won't take up too much time here with that. But um, what Coleridge is pointing to more is um, the imagination as something that comes through us and that, you know, the artist, the poet shapes that. And in that way, it's the coming through that is in common with what Jung is talking about. But the way that Jung would deny that what he was doing was art, that's where I think he's missing some of the, what Tolkien or Coleridge would want to talk about in terms of the shaping of what comes through into um, an artistic creation. I think Jung is doing that, but he's not really um, owning that that's what he's doing. I actually think that he doesn't really fully acknowledge what art is when he says that what he 
is doing is an art. In terms of Corbin, um, I think that Corbin's ideas are actually the most applicable to what was happening for Jung because uh, Henri Corbin speaks about the mundus imaginalis, the world of the imagination or the imaginal realm, and that it's through active imagination that we access another realm. And that idea, I personally feel, is maybe the best way of really understanding and explaining what was happening to Jung. And if we were having a different parallel conversation, what also was happening for Tolkien at that time? I think, I think if anyone came to the talk that we had um, with Professor Michael Ward, oh, yeah. it, it's also interesting to note, I have to throw it in, Becca, you know me, I'm like, you have to toss in that it's interesting that C.S. Lewis was perhaps subtly experimenting with uh, similar um, modes of Im Im embedding these really deep, rich archetypal themes in his um, not only his his science fiction novels, but his um, his Narnia chronicles. Yeah, um, and they were of course they were contemporaries too. Um, so anyway, that's we Becca and I when we first decided we were going to do some some talks together, we suggested a three part series. If I'm not mistaken, didn't we, Becca? We did. So what was the third one going to be? The third one was going to be bringing um, Jung and Tolkien and astrology all together. But, and I think we've talked about this as well, that I think it would be really fun to bring Tolkien and Lewis and yeah. astrology together. That would, that would be fantastic, actually. Yeah, not, I'm, I don't know if I, you are the one to do that, not I, but I would, I would gladly watch. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we could add it down the line. <laughs> cool. It'd be fun. Okay, let's see what else. There's a world of difference between a daydream fantasy and a full-on ision in which a vivid dream unfolds in broad waking consciousness. Yeah. Um, at Sarah R Ruland, I used, okay, never mind. That's some people chatting. The Inklings, yeah, yeah, totally. How did you, I just have to ask the question if you saw the uh, sort of fictionalized movie that came out about Tolkien's life and how you felt, would you recommend it? I have been asked my opinion on this so many times that I think I'm going to have to make a video or write a review of it. Um, I, I feel like it was beautiful. I feel like it was poetic. Um, the, something I really appreciated about it was the pacing, the music, the slowness of it. Uh, also, how much they communicate just through image. And for people who... Um, you know, love uh, the kind of Hillmanian idea of stay with the image. They did that. They depicted things through image that would really only pull something out of you in response if you knew Tolkien's stories well. That being said, they did take certain liberties with Tolkien's life, um, whether it's the timing or just the unfolding of things, omissions such as his deep commitment to Catholicism. It, it's not a full picture. And of course, we can never expect to get a full picture. The thing for me personally that I disliked the most was the fact that they made too obvious of connections between his stories and things that didn't even happen in his life. So for example, um, he and um, his wife, Edith, going to hear Wagner's ring cycle. Tolkien was adamantly clear that he said, the only thing they have in common is that both wing rings were round. That's actually not true. There is more in common. But he, if he wouldn't have wanted it, shouldn't we at least respect that? Um, likewise, having his Batman in um, the First World War being called Sam is just a little too obvious. Um, right. It's just, it wouldn't, he also didn't, he didn't fight. He never went into no man's land. He did go, um, to France, he was in the Battle of the Somme, but he wasn't an infantry man. He wasn't um, literally crossing over the field into uh, machine gun fire like his closest friends were, who who died in that um, in that conflict. He was a signal man because he had extraordinary skill with language and map making, as we see in his stories. So those skills were specifically used. So he was actually shielded from the action because of that. So those are some things that I wish they hadn't changed or just didn't feel necessary. But at a kind of poetic 
symbolic level, I do think that they captured something. And I love that people are looking into that period of Tolkien's life mm. because it is really the essential period. So. Yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you. I, I thought everyone might be interested to hear your take on that. I know I was. Um, yeah. Also, uh, did Jung date the illustrations? It's, I feel like, did you answer this already? Um, a lot of them are dated and um, you do have to kind of pick through things. Some are more clearly dated. You know, it'll be written at the bottom um, in German. If you look through the uh, footnotes, you can usually find the dates of pretty much everything. Sham Dasani is, he's not a psychologist, he's a historian. So he brings a historian's mind to the editing process. There are, I think like 1500 footnotes in the Red Book. And um, so you can get pretty much every date that's available, which is definitely worth uh, looking into. Cause yeah, every one of those illustrations has a birth chart. Um, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. What, like when people get a copy of the Red Book, um, you know, there's, there's a reader's guide to the Red Book. You've seen that little, the, um, it's like a small, it's not the hulking. Do you know what right. I'm talking about, Becca? It's like a, a smaller. Reader's right. edition. The reader's um, edition, yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't guide you. It's right. It's just the text. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, my question is, do you recommend any way of, entering into the experience of reading the red book in a way that's more intentional, that's more um, ceremonial, sacred? Like, how do you suggest people approach the actual experience of having the red book in their home? I'm just, I'm getting a little shamanic about it, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And if you have the, the large version, the facsimile version, I think that it, it's really an extraordinary experience to read it from that. It's difficult because it is so actually physically large. The first time I read the Red Book all the way through, I read that version and it's a commitment. You have to you know, put it out on the table and you flip back and forth between the facsimile and the translation. And um, so what I would say is that if that reading it from that version is really worth it, but there is something to be said about reading it from the reader's edition. And if you've, um, if you only have the reader's edition, then uh, trying to find the images, at least online can be helpful. They're all marked where they should be. I think if you can afford it, the ideal way to do this is to have the big version and to have the reader's edition and carry them side by side. That's, what I've done. Um, like wherever like, you go, just wherever, wherever you go. <laughs> um, I know. I mean, my, my little reader's edition is very well traveled at this point and um, gone to quite a few different countries actually. And, uh, but I like marginalia. I like being able to write in my books and underline important things in a very beautiful, neat way. Um, so that's why I like having the reader's edition as well. But in terms of actually approaching the text, and I would say that, first of all, start with the introduction. Sham Dasani's introduction is wonderful. Um, that'll help orient you to begin with. And then read no more than five, maybe eight pages a day. The thing that I personally found and that a lot of my students have found and other people I've talked to is that there's a saturation point. It's not the kind of thing where you can just, you know, like, oh, I'm going to read the Red Book now and read as far as I can. I actually think it's a disservice to students to have it crammed into too small a time period because it's too much. And if you can break it down into, you know, five pages a day or just five page increments, then you can take that in and digest it. And the thing with the Red Book is that it really bears multiple readings because things that are stated at the beginning don't make sense till the end. Um, and it, is, it has this kind of circular, in fact, it has a mandolic quality. So you can't really understand the beginning till you get to the end and you can't really understand the end unless you've gone through the beginning. Um, so I would just say being patient, setting aside um, a significant or a special period of time when you do read that small portion, not to ask too much of yourself, 
pay attention to your dreams when you're doing oh, it. Yeah. Pay attention to synchronicities. Um, strange things happen. A lot of people have really visceral reactions to it. As I mentioned at the beginning, I know some people who just want to destroy it or shoot it or light it on fire or drown it in a lake. Um, and to maybe accept that that's okay. Um, instead of feeling like you're supposed to be having some profound experience with this book, I never would have thought this is what I'd become an expert in. <laughs> <laughs> never would have crossed my mind. And it still kind of baffles me. And yet I have a kind of love for it where, um, but it's like a deep, visceral, complicated love for this, this work. Thank you. I was glad you, I wanted to hear you cover that aspect of the reception of the red book and into our psyches. Um, because that, that part for me, when I read it was huge and it became, I don't know if you, have you heard of, um, uh, Hodorowsky before? Do you know a bit yeah. about him? He's kind yeah. of has, uh, he's known for giving people these uh, sort of elaborate shamanic prescription journeys that they'll go on and they'll do these elaborate things. And, uh, you know, eventually I'll, maybe I'll, at some point I hope to write the story of, of, of my own sort of bizarre magical adventure with the red book, but it did, it felt like something that needed to be engaged with on more levels than just the intellectual level. And that actually wasn't even, it just started happening as you said, through dreams and other synchronicities. So I think that's a, it's it's a very it's like a totem too once you read it you either I, in my experience is you either enshrine it somewhere and it holds like an altar type of place or you feel this weird need to like pass it on or maybe burn it like in a respectful way like it's a very powerful totem though yeah it's so. that's part of why i kept emphasizing that it is an intersection of the universal and the individual because if we just take this as only Jung or only his psychology, then why is it doing that to us when we read it? It's because we're tapping into something that's collective, that's universal. Yes, there are really personal elements here and it is extremely exposing. And that in itself is very controversial in terms of what Jung was going through. But um, recognizing that kind of transpersonal side of it, I think helps explain why the profound experiences that um, unfold in response to it, whether they're total violent rejection or um, kind of in rapture, mm -hmm. we can kind of see that a little more. And yeah. I do think the astrological language can help with that because it puts it in this larger context and um, we can see it as yet another expression of these planetary gods beautiful i really especially liked when you mentioned the need to i in my class i have my students practice like if you can for this year while we're studying together when when you say you know instead of saying my moon or my mercury or my venus try to say oh the moon in my birth chart was in this sign in this house when i was born or you know, the, the Saturn was traveling through the first house and the, you know, the temple of Aquarius, like almost like trying to revive some of the, some of the um, more vivid understanding of these planetary archetypes as gods with temples and places and some autonomy so that we have psychic space within which to relate to them, participate with them. Sometimes I think if we, if we identify with them, too much it feeds into the weird way in which the conflation with the archetypes can you know pull us along in very unconscious ways and obviously both Jung and Hillman talked a lot about that too so I really appreciated that point I just wanted to mention that it feels like such an important um, side of relating to to the astrological archetypes that we do need to disidentify from them, even at the same time as we have to take responsibility for how we are vessels for them. Yeah. Um, so it really is a kind of a both and situation. And it, which is, I, I, if I was a, my understanding is that this is specifically why um, Jung said that, you know, the gods have become our diseases. If we, if we, if we aren't carrying them 
if we're not making our, our lives, our bodies, our, our psyches as a home for the gods and the, the play of the gods, so to speak, um, they often show up in our disease. Um, so that's such an important point. And maybe, maybe to me, the most valuable thing about the Red Book is just the call to participate. Mm-hmm. And it, the Red Book in itself is such, um, it carries that really fine line between um, the disease, the madness, the psychosis, and the, the spiritual vision. It's mm-hmm. right there at that edge. And he knows it's right there at that edge. Um, and so it shows you what you can do how you can, if you're pulled on such a journey, how you can hold it and contain it and turn it into something that not only is of use to you or, or saves you, but actually can be of benefit to others. And that was a big part of what Jung felt as well, that when we go inward in that way or when we take time away from society, we have to come back with something we have to bring the gift back from our journeys. Absolutely. Um, one thing that also popped into my head um, while you were talking tonight that just came back to me just now is, um, you know, I've got two little girls and I'm, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, three, four years into the parenting experience. And I keep thinking as an astrologer um, and, and as someone who, is a big fan of, of Hillman and Jung and active imagination. And I keep thinking there's got to be some really, we've got to, I think we've got to take up the project of creating some active imagination, astrology, like literature, film, like oh, there's so much out there for kids, like children's books and, you know, educational programs and things like that. And I keep thinking about some way of bringing active imagination and astrology together for little, little kids. Cause I, I think it's, they're already in that space in such a strong way. So to start bringing in, you know, like obviously fairy tales is a great example, but just like, I'm also thinking about this cause I'm trying to think of how I might introduce my girls to what I do for a living. Right. So it, it comes into my mind a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a, uh, yeah, I think, you know, fairy story, um, and myth for sure can be a really helpful way of getting to know these, these figures. Um, You know, they, they are in a state of active imagination all the time, as you're saying, Um, you know, I'm thinking back, as you know, I'm a second generation astrologer and um, so grew up in a household where astrology was being talked about. I I wasn't taught it, Um, but I was, when I was about six years old, I think I've shared this story with you before. Uh, I did ask my dad for a reading and I don't remember it very well, but the main thing that I recall was the way he was describing the planets. He's like, he said, you know, they're, they're like the gods and goddesses of the myths that you already know. And so having that mythological ground, there is a, a familiarity already. Good call. Yeah, that's good call. Uh, as I said that, I suddenly realized like, well, you would be a good person to talk to <laughs> since you were raised in an astrologer's home. So that's, yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Watch out for rebellion though. I think part <laughs> of the reason I'm here is because I, it wasn't forced on me. It wasn't um, something, it, I came to it of my own volition. And then when I did, the door opened. Right, right. We're going to, we'll, we'll sit them down. There will be astrological school uniforms and <laughs> attendance will be mandatory. I'm just kidding. So, okay, cool. Um, any last questions that we want to ask before we close shop tonight? This has been such a fantastic uh, journey. As any one of you are entering in uh, more questions in the chat box, I do want to remind everybody because there are a few minutes left. I want to remind you of a couple of things, first and foremost, where you can make a donation if you haven't already. Let's support Becca's amazing work, all of the time, blood, sweat, and tears that she's put into um, being able to articulate all of this so fluidly and poetically. I mean, it's just amazing. So um, I'm super inspired by Becca all the time. I remember when I was first starting, I, I watched a video online of Becca, like giving a talk about Tolkien. And I think it was in a teepee. <laughs> like, and it was, it was so fantastic. And I was like, 
I just was like, I was like amazed. Like this is, this person is speaking my language about Tolkien and, and astrology and da da da. And so I'm so happy that years later we became friends and colleagues. Oh, I'm, I'm very grateful that you, you reached out after that talk and then we met at Norwalk a few years ago and um, yeah, it's I'm really grateful for everything that you, you bring forward and create. Thank you. So Follow the link there, nightlightastrology.com to the payments and donation tab. Um, 15 to 25 suggested. Let's support Becca's awesome work again. Um, let's see. I want to point you all toward um, a few things that are coming up next Wednesday night. Um, Alex Garrett will be here giving a talk on the lunation cycle. If you want to understand the different archetypal dimensions of the lunation cycle and how to read them in your birth chart or even a progress chart if you know what that is this talk will be accessible for people who are newer to astrology as well as those who are you know more uh advanced so should be really fun uh check that out next wednesday night the li the link is posted on my website under the events page so you can just click it log in come back donate when you're here if you want a recording of the talks um, and you donate, you can just email me saying you'd like a copy of the recording. That's nightlightastrology at gmail.com. Just email me and say, I attended, I donated, I'd like a copy of the recording and I'll send it. Um, this, you can't get the recording afterward. The rights go back over to Becca. So um, just tonight, if you were here, you can have a copy. Um, then um, also on the... And, Will you please, Becca, will you tell me how to pronounce Laura's last name? Because I always mess it up. Is it Machetti? Machetti. Laura Machetti. Yeah. Um, she, I, I'll definitely give a plug for her. Uh, Laura is one of my absolute closest friends. We started our PhDs at the same time. And she has been practicing astrology for, I think, two decades or longer and um, is just an extraordinary scholar and um, practitioner bringing together astrology and divination. And she's writing her dissertation right now on uh, Sami divination practices and their relationship to ecology. It's just an extraordinary project. She's an excellent speaker. She's, I can't um, speak more highly of her. So her talk will be fascinating. I will definitely be there. Um, annoyingly in the front row with my camera on. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That is Sunday, November 17th at noon Eastern time. Again, you can find all of this information on the events page of my website, nightlightastrology.com. Becca, thanks again so much for being here tonight, um, just for your expertise and your candor and just everything. You're awesome. We love you. So we hope that you'll come back too and we can we'll either talk about Tolkien and Jung and tie it all together or maybe we'll come up with something else sometime in 2020. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you, everyone who's there. Um, this was such a joy to be able to present. Okay. Take care, everyone. You all have a nice night. Bye.